way we get to, and we're graduated from school. So the last we had was really the office. And, and you strip that away and then you've got to replace it with something. And what we see Outpost as is an opportunity to really build that community based on proximity. It's not community isn't built on 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 on, on shared interest and a, and, a, and a and a swipe right or a click on a like button. It's built on repetitious um, interactions with people and through shared experiences. I believe it's taking over for what's lost in in terms of the office space and. And one of the things that I've looked at is how does, um, when we look at workspace, how does workspace change so that the office doesn't cater to the needs of the company, it caters to the needs of the individual. And so what I see is, 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 is co-working changing towards serving the needs of the individual. And I think co-living uh, as, a, as a corollary is coming in and really focusing on the individual experience while they're in the space rather than the, rather than the transaction. Christine here with another fun episode of the Co-Living Code Show. It airs every Wednesday. And I wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, ISL Furnishings. They're a brand created through Interspace Living and they're all about creating exciting spaces where design meets function. They've actually done a quarters in Star City. So they've definitely done some big communities, some awesome, awesome stuff. You could see the pictures on their websites. Interspace parlayed its success in commercial grade unit furniture and conceived an elevated offering. And they strongly believe in the co-living industry, which is cool. And they were founded with the mission to bring your brand to life. Their goal is to revolutionize the unit furniture experience. And driven by creativity, ISL Furnishings believe that interiors should inspire brilliance. Every venue has its own voice. They exist to clarify that voice, interpret your brand vision, and deliver to quality on time, every time. And like I said, yes, they've done Star City and Quarters, but they've also done smaller communities. They can do 10 beds and up. And you can definitely check them out at islfurnishings.com. So let's go ahead and launch into today's episode. Christine here with this week's episode. You know, it's fun to see how international co-living is. Today, we brought on David. He's actually American, but he's living in Singapore right now, and his co-living community is in Bali. So uh, we talk about that. It is late over there in Singapore when we do this interview. So I'll go ahead and read his bio, and we'll jump right into the episode. It was 4.30 p.m., and David was sitting in a coffee shop in Tokyo writing what was to be his best-selling book on sustainable energy sources. He wondered why all these people were working in the heart of the city remotely, why they couldn't be in an idyllic place like Bali. Building on his experience working with diverse communities from the White House and remote Lithuanian villages to remote African villages, he set out to create a community-focused space that sought to facilitate the unique lifestyle of anywhere workers. Outpost now has a network of award-winning living and works, working spaces serving a community of remote workers. As the global shift towards remote work continues to grow, it is an exciting time for Outpost as more and more people will begin working from anywhere. Outpost will no doubt be one of the first places these people head to. David has lived in Lithuania teaching at a university, has worked in Japan's Ministry of Economy and on Wall Street, ran and managed charity providing clean water to people in need in Africa. He understands the challenges of an anywhere life work style firsthand. So let's go ahead and get into this week's episode with David with Outpost. Okay, so this week bringing on David with Outpost. You know, it's funny because I actually saw Outpost being built in Bali back in early 2018 when I went there. So excited to finally bring you on the show this week. Thanks, Christine. Great to be here. Great. And uh, first question. So when did you guys start and did you start in Bali? So we started Outpost in Bali and it opened in 2016. The idea came about probably about 12, 000, 2012. Uh, at that point, I was uh, traveling and I was uh, doing research for a book. I was writing a book on sustainability. And I was finding myself in, in Brazil and, and Tokyo and a whole bunch of other random cities. And I was working from coffee shops. And it was about 4.30 in the afternoon. And I was in Tokyo, I believe. And I looked around and other people were working in coffee shops. And 
I knew what I was doing there, but what were all these people there? And why did they have to be in a city? If they could break away, why couldn't they be in an idyllic place? And uh, Indonesia has always been um, you know, fascinating to me, and I've always enjoyed my experience there. So it was not soon after that that I decided um, with my partner, that, who also had a kind of a nomadic career, that we should open up a place for us. And so that really led to one thing led to another. And we both had some free time, if you will, during our, our career uh, pause. And we decided to open up Outpost as a side project. Love that. And then do you guys have multiple locations in Bali or just the one? So at the beginning of 2020, we had four locations in operations. We had three in Bali and we have uh, one in Cambodia. Nice. And then where are you located yep. right now during these COVID times? So I'm located in Singapore. We have a, a couple of locations in, in uh, Bali still operating. Um, and we're still seeing uh, some, some people there, even though travel is restricted. Um, there are some people who are remaining. And there are uh, uh, folks from Jakarta, uh, the main city in Indonesia, coming to Bali. And, and there are also some uh, foreigners who are trickling in. Uh, so we're, we're continuing operations and I'm just a little bit removed from the day to day. So I'm here in Singapore. Nice. And were you there right before COVID and then jumped over? So I was in COVID. I was uh, actually moving from Bali to Bangkok, uh, at the beginning of March and I packed up all my stuff in Bali and I was scouting for, uh, places in Bangkok, uh, to, to, to live and was deciding, um, what apartment made sense and, and things in March started to get a little bit more sketchy. Now, we had always been concerned about, about, about COVID for, for a while. In, in January, we ordered our first box of masks. So we realized that there was some, some challenges that were coming our way. And in mid-March, it became clear that um, my time in, in Bangkok would be slim if I didn't have the right visas. So I came back to Singapore, where our company is based and uh, have been living here ever, ever, ever since. Yeah, and I know you guys have had some, some pretty strict... Uh, COVID guidelines on the lockdown there, right? Right. Uh, it's been, it's been, uh, it was a little slow to start in Singapore. So the lockdown really came into place in April 7th. And I think if uh, they look back, they probably wish they started a little bit earlier. Yeah. Uh, but from April 7th to middle of June, it was a complete lockdown. And because I was coming from Bangkok, uh, the day after I landed, I was told that people from Bangkok were under a quarantine. And I, I didn't think I was under a quarantine, but I wasn't too sure. So I stayed pretty much to myself. And uh, so I was pretty much, uh, for lack of a better word, locked up from the middle of March until until early June. Oh, wow. So it was a, a stretch of over 80 some odd days. Woo. Oh, my gosh. And so obviously you can't, luckily you're removed from the business. So the, the locations in Bali are doing fine. What occupancy rate? Because I know a lot of the expat, I know a lot of Bali is such a, popular destination. I definitely want to touch more on that um, for expats visiting. Maybe they stay one to three months. Um, it's beautiful there. And how did, what's the occupancy rate now? Because I know a lot of them went back home. So we, in, in April and, and May, we had shut down. We were a, a co, you know, as a co-living experience, we didn't, um, we weren't understanding of, of the impacts of, 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 of COVID. We had taken many steps. We ordered a special uh, disinfectant to come in for overseas, but we didn't like the, the communal aspect during a pandemic. This is, you know, this is all of our first pandemics and, and we wanted to err on the side of caution. So we shut down uh, till uh, middle of June and then, and then we've opened up. And, and what's surprising and, and rewarding at the same time is that despite people leaving over time because eventually they wanted to get back home, our occupancy has risen. Now, for sure, our, our price has, has dropped um, significantly as we cater a little more towards uh, local tourists and, and, and folks in Indonesia um, are the ones who own properties are, are dropping uh, their prices. So we've dropped ours as well. We've had one location as, as of this month is about 40, 45 percent and another one's about 80, 85 percent. So we're, we're pleased with the occupancy, um, but it's, it's not... Um, you know, the rates are things we'd like to see get higher and, and they will over time. Definitely, definitely. And then if we, now let's back up to, you know, when you guys started the ethos of outposts, you know, pre-COVID, right? So I know you use the term anywhere worker. So I would love for you to elaborate on that. Well, we saw, my partner and I saw ourselves as anywhere workers. He was a, a finance nomad. He was based in Shanghai. He could be 
anywhere within Asia because he would often have meetings. So why would he have to continually go back to Shanghai? Why did he have to pay Shanghai rents and deal with 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 the tens of millions, literally people living with around him? And and he wanted a, an idyllic spot. So so Bali became this hub for for anywhere workers, for people who could remote work remotely. And increasingly, we saw that as everyone. What you know, the simple fact was that everyone started to use the same tool, the laptop. And then once internet connectivity came together, it, it became clear that 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 the trend was going towards an anywhere, anywhere work. And what we've seen af- ha- happen through this pandemic is that what this was, was this niche sect of a few million people who had the flexibility to work remotely for days, weeks, or months at a time. We're now seeing uh, a drastic change. You know, the, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve has a study that said slightly more than 40% of all jobs can be re- done remotely full time. Right? We've got Booking.com, which last month came out with a study that said 37% of the people of their travelers are planning to book a trip to a place where they can work. And so this is a fundamental change. And for someone who focuses on, on destination co-living, like we do, this, this has been our opportunity um, to, to be able to capitalize on a demand where business isn't leading business travel. Yes. Leisure is leading business traveler. So uh, travel. So when historically people would go to Hong Kong for a meeting and then they would stay on four days and, and enjoy the city. The opposite is now happening. People are saying, hey, I'd love to, and although they're doing it domestically, hey, I'd love to go to the coast of Mississippi, or I'd like to go to the, uh, you know, the Italian coast, and I'd like to spend time there, and then I'll work. And so we think that this is a fundamental change. Now, whether this change is only 2%, 5%, 30% of the workforce, it's still a massive change. And we're excited as as one of the few um, hospitality players to, to serve remote work. Um, we're excited about it. And uh, I, I think what we see is that um, so- soon um, these companies, the traditional hospitality players, are focusing on remote work, but they're saying, hey, come to our space, work. But people who are working from home and they don't like being at home because it's, it's hard and it's boring, aren't going to trade a, a, their room for a hotel room. Mm-hmm because they don't want to be just as bored in their place and then go to a hotel room. They'll find after a few weeks that while it's great to open up your window and see the beach, um, ultimately a bed and a desk isn't what people are looking for when they're remote working. They still want that aspect of the socialness of the office. No, and that, okay, so for the Federal Reserve in the U.S. said 40% of jobs here in the U.S. could be worked remotely. Correct. Was that during Correct. COVID? They figured that number out or before? The study was done uh, during COVID. Uh, but my assessment is they looked at all of the jobs that, that, that people had and said, all right, well, the waitress can't be done remotely. Um, you know, a, 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 you know, actor couldn't be done remotely. Um, you know, assembly working couldn't be done remotely. But all these other jobs can. Mine can, um, for sure. And, and anyone in marketing can, and people are slowly realizing what can be done. And so that's what the Federal Reserve highlighted. Got it. And then you're from the States originally. Were you from originally in the States? New York. Cool. Okay. New York. Oh, and I know you have a background. I was going to ask about that. Commodities, trading, and you worked on Wall Street, right? So I worked in, I worked in finance, that's correct. I, before that, I worked um, in the office of the president. I worked on uh, some foreign assistance, so funding that was um, going to development of, of, of countries. Um, I also ran a, a nonprofit in Uganda where we built water wells. Um, so I've, I've, I've meandered in my career a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know what, ex- what really excites me about Outpost um, is, is something that I've always um, appreciate about my work is how do, how do you introduce people to a new culture? And, and Outpost has that opportunity to, to, to introduce people to, whether it's Cambodia or Indonesia and soon Sri Lanka, um, w- what the culture is there. But ultimately, it allows people to reflect on their own country. And to me, that was always the most important part of traveling. It, it questioned why I did what I did. 
That's awesome. So you worked in the White House. What years? When was that? So it was 2003 to 2007. Oh, cool. Okay. Awesome. And then the, I also, you know, I know you have a book, the Sustainable Energy Sources book. So you're passionate about that, obviously. Correct. Correct. I, I was, um, I focused on commodities and commodity trading. And, and the question I was looking at was what happens when technology spreads around the world and, and what happens when our green technology becomes the things, the things we use every day. So in essence, what happens when we trade our, our, our Oldsmobile um, that's, gas, that's gas powered for Teslas? You know, they, they, the cars look the same and they serve the same function, but the resources that go into them are drastically different. So what happens when we're relying on lithium batteries and, and cobalt and um, when we're making um, materials that are lighter and, and stronger and more powerful? Um, we're, we're getting rid of old resources and new, using new ones. So I spent a few years wondering what the environmental impact is, what the economic impact, geopolitical impact of this switch. So that's what I spent several years doing before opening up a, a, a co-living uh, establishment. And for sustainability, how do you tie in sustainability into the outpost concept? Well, I, I look at how do we use, in the book I talk about being more efficient with the materials that we use. How do you, how do you re, re, how do you make something last longer? How do you reuse it? Um, and and recycling is kind of the last the last pillar, if you will, and it's one that I don't focus a lot of time on. So how do we how do we do more with less? Um, is something that that's important to us. Trying to make quality decisions in terms of materials. Trying to renovate as little as possible to get the same result that we have. Um, so I, I look about how do we, when we're making a decision, how do we lean green? How do we try and take a greener alternative um, rather than, than, than something that's, um, you know, quicker, could be potentially easier, but has a, has a, has a higher environmental footprint? Nope, that's awesome. And that makes sense, right? On a global level, for sure. The, um, I know you're very passionate about building community. Um, you know, I know that hotels are kind of, you know, and I'm sure I've heard you say this on another interview, um, you know, in their lobby, they're putting some co-working desks, you know, um, you know, right. what are your, you know, again, they're trying to, to do some sort of community in the hotels. I don't know. Um, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. What's it? Do, do people want it? Um, do, does someone who's coming on a business trip and staying at the Four Points by Sheraton really want to know who's staying down the hall? Probably not. So the question is, what is your what is the what is the brand? What's the ethos of your what you're trying to um, to, to build? And for Outpost, when people ask questions before they're coming to stay, they're not asking us what the thread count on the on the sheets is or how big the room. And we focus on those. You have to be comfortable. But what they're asking is, who's staying next to me? What, what, what events are going on? And if I'm checking in at the Marriott, those, I'm, not, I'm not asking those questions. So, so for us, being able to set up ways for people to communicate is critical. And we do that in the design of our spaces. How do we, how do we think about how do we use space? Um, I think one of the, the examples that I often cite is that uh, when we were renovating our first property, um, we were getting rid of the main staircase and um, we were putting in a side staircase and we had an option to, to design the staircase to be grand or something that's a little bit smaller. And we chose it a little bit smaller because it allowed, it made people often pass by each other and the staircase wasn't wide enough so that two people could pass each other that when one person was going by, they had to look up and then, they, oh, please go on by. They, they had to have some kind of communication. So you can do a lot with the design, but they're trying to facilitate interaction. And then obviously when we're having, you know, 200 events a year or so, um, we try and find ways for people to get together. So there are social events um, that, are, um, that get people together. Uh, we've, looking back on the Thanksgiving event we had last year, comes to mind just because we're um, talking about, we're, we're in that season at the moment. Um, and then also, Everything from from SEO uh, to to, um, to 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 
other aspects of digital marketing to um, self-awareness. There's a lot of types of different uh, trainings and, and seminars that we do have. You read my mind. That was my next question about what kind of events you guys do. That is super impressive. You guys do 200 events a year, again, pre-COVID. But it's, it's what people are coming for. And, and they're, the difference between destination co-living and other types of co-living, um, more traditional, if we can use that word traditional, is that when someone decides to come all the way around the world, they're leaving everything behind. But when you get it, so, so everything becomes a service. They want to meet friends. They want to go out to dinner. Everything, nothing, everything is new. And so they want to immerse themselves. But if a, in, a, in a traditional co-living, um, they're looking for a great place to be. And it's a bonus if they, have, they can meet people. You know? So they have their job. They have their friends. So it's an incumbent for us to provide more. And that's what people come back for. Yeah, no, so it's like, and especially this, you know, the the generation of the millennials and everybody, they want to be immersed in experience, right? Correct, correct. They, they want to be immersed in experience. Um, they want to see the place they're at. They want to have an impact. Um, and and one of the things that, um, you know, we, we encourage, although we have multiple locations, is that people spend time at a, a specific spot. And to you really start to experience a place the longer you're there there becomes more routines you meet more people along the way because you're taking that same route to work um uh, you know same work that and and you're meeting people that you wouldn't meet if you if you just saw them once but that routine becomes important and and i think when we look at this this covid era this you know we all feel a little bit empty at, at the moment and sure there's the pressure of um, COVID itself, um, the, the pandemic is, and those affected by it, it's, it's been uh, tremendously sad and, and impactful if you've if actually had it. But we've also ripped out the last, in many cases, the last social support of our society. You know, we've, we, we, we as a society, we don't go to a religious service as much. There's not a town square that people are meeting at. The local bar has kind of drifted away. And the way we get, to, and we're graduated from school, so the last we had was really the office. And, and you strip that away, and then you've got to replace it with something. And what we see Outpost as is an opportunity to really build that community based on proximity. It's not, community isn't built on, 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 on shared interest and a, and, a, and, a, and a swipe right or a click on a like button. It's built on repetitious um, interactions with people and through shared experiences. And it's not, you know, our best, for, I can look back on my childhood. My best friends weren't the ones that we had the shared interest with. They're the people who I met because we lived down the street from each other and we found a way to be friends. And, and those bonds are, are probably stronger than some of the ones where I have shared interests with folks. I love that quote. That needs to be a quote. It's not swiping right or like clicking the like button. That's not how you make friends. <laughs> Very true. It's, 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 really, it's really not, I think, um, because we're all doing that now uh, because that's all we've got. And it's, it's you know, I've, I, I find something's missing. Um, you know, I've I had the good fortune of been traveling for a while, um, although I don't travel like I used to. And when you do travel now, you become so spoiled. You, you land um, and you, you, find an, you find an Uber or, or Grab, depending where you are. And everyone's meeting you and you're not interacting with people. And, and you get to the point where you feel as a traveler that they need your service. You know? They need you. You're, you're, you're employing them. But when you used to travel and you couldn't call someone, and you had to talk to the taxi driver. You had a real sense that you needed them. Yeah. And so there's this fundamental change. And so I, what I see is a lot of technology being adopted by um, hotels, co-living providers, and that's great. Um, it works for their need. But when someone's coming all the way around the world and their goal is to interact with the space, when someone comes to Outpost, we're, we're greeting them with a hello. There's, they've just traveled 20 hours or longer if you're coming from New York. 
you, you don't need the speed to get into your room. You want to be welcomed. You want to experience the culture. And, and so um, I, love, I, I see technology being very important to us, but not in the ways that, um, that, that strip away that, that human connection. I know. I miss my riding my scooter through the rice fields in Bali. <laughs> it's my little scooter. Yeah. Right. Right. So, no, and meeting, you know, and you're right. It's just, how do you get plugged in? So, right, I, you know, I landed and I'm like, where do I go? And what's the best restaurant? And um, where's the best place, you know, to, to find and meet people, like-minded people? Um, there was a popular co-working space. I'm trying to remember what it was called. Because um, again, I didn't know about Outpost then. So there are a number. There are a number. There are yeah. There are a number. There are a number on the island. Um, each do something different. I think what you're seeing now is cafes coming in on the um, trying to to take some of that crowd. Mm-hmm. Um, but the real real point is 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 there a place to meet people? And and for us, you talk about like minded community. For us, that community is entrepreneurial. It's creative. It's internationally minded. Um, those are the those are the people that we're seeking. Those who want to explore the world, they want to grow personally and professionally, and connect with others in the places um, the places that they that they go. Um, so that's that's who we focus on. Others focus on uh, those who can surf and and those who want to go out and and uh, and, and and drink and those. You know, so there is different aspects of each. And um, we feel that that community we have creates a great social vibe. And they're just fascinating people there. And I'm guessing it's a lot of digital nomads, right? It depends what, you, what a digital nomad is. Are you, would, you, would you consider yourself a digital nomad? I am not. I wouldn't consider myself that. <laughs> yeah. So I think what we're seeing are... are, are We'll just say nomads. We call them new nomads. I don't know if there's a great term. It because I'd say five, ten percent of our people are those who ones who are traveling mm-hmm. all of the time. Um, but most of our people, it's it's weeks or months, and then they go back. And historically, they would go back because they wanted to get new clients or they had to go back for their job. But the way remote work is happening, we see people coming back and forth. Um, and they have that ability to do that, or they'll come out for two months. Um, the, that the remote work experiment has succeeded in many senses, um, but at the same point, when I talk about that that emptiness feeling, people are going to find want to want to get ways um, get back together, and, and and the offices aren't dead either. Um, it's just a, a reworking of how we're going to use these spaces to create community. No, and I'm so glad, you know, everybody wonders, what's a digital nomad? Or they kind of shy away from the word, you know, there, there is a difference, right? So I say I'm not a digital nomad. I'm not nomadic. It's more of the, what I call the hub and spoke model, which I heard that term years ago. And I'm like, oh, that's what I do. You know, Southern California is my base. You know, that's my hub. But then the spoke is like, okay, I'll jump to Europe, live there for five months, come back. You know, you know, I'll just kind of jump for like a month or two, um, and but then always end up, you know, in my hub for a longer period of time um, versus jumping around. But I'm digital, so I could work from anywhere in the world. So I'm the digital side, not so much the nomadic side. Um, and then what's your age range that stay there? Right. We typically twenty four to forty two is about is the age range. It's um, about fifty two, fifty three percent male. So it's almost mm-hmm. it's almost it's a split evenly. Um, and yeah, it's it's digital nomad isn't the right term, but that, that it doesn't it doesn't we're all we're all can travel because of the laptops. But um, I think we find more people like yourself. Um, who are professional, who are established in their career. Um, they want to soak up a different culture for a while. Um, and, and that's kind of our sweet spot. And so we're excited to be able to offer more locations so that people can go from place to place. Um, and they know that the community they're going into is something somewhere where they'll feel comfortable because there are switching costs. As someone who lived in New York and D.C. and you know, every time you go to a new space, and it's 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 wonderful. There's so much to see, but how do you get connected again? And and that part, when you're doing it time after time, 
gets a little bit tiring, but when you're familiar with some of the rituals and routines that you have at different outpost locations, and then you you feel like there's a, a, a continuance of your experience, even though you, you, you've moved to a new place. And that's what we're really excited to provide, um, especially as, as the world of, of remote working has, or anywhere work has, has really um, unfolded in front of us. And so that's so funny. We ask that question usually on the show and it's usually 50-50 split. It doesn't matter what type of co-living it is. It's interesting to see. It's usually 50-50 guys and girls. That's really cool. I mean, that's pretty standard. Um, what's your guys' minimum stay? And I'd love to hear where are you guys planning on uh, future locations? Sure. So uh, our, we do not have a minimum stay. Our average stay, because of that, if you mix in uh, the folks who come for a month and those who come for a couple of days, is about 10, 10 14 days. Um, so uh, it's you, you can't come for two or three days and, and get the whole experience. But it, those two or three days, it's an eye-opening opportunity for people who are just, I just want to see what it's like, or maybe I can live this way. Um, or they're they're looking for that social atmosphere that they missed in a hostel, but they don't want to hear, they don't, they don't want to hear Kira's um, snoring, um, you know, two beds down. So there's no, there's no hotel niche or hospitality niche that fits that social aspect the way an outpost location does. Um, so that people are kind of too often frightened, if you will, to, to go speak to someone in real life. Um, they want to connect beforehand. So my hope is that when people are in outposts, they're not afraid to say, oh, I saw you reading that, reading that, what, what is that magazine? Or some way that they can get back to connecting the people who they, who they see. Um, so when we look at new locations, what really excites me are, are, are places in my mind that are, are idyllic. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, Sri Lanka is a fabulous place. Um, we think there are a number of, a number of opportunities there. Um, we love we love Thailand uh, and think it's think it's a, it's a fabulous opportunity. Um, Vietnam is, a, is an lovely, another lovely spot. Um, in terms of the types of places we look at, um, they our properties now are about 20 to 30 rooms. Um, we see 30 rooms and, and 30 to f yeah, up to 80 um, can can work. Um, more than that, it's a little bit uh, troublesome unless it's in a city, but that's a different dynamic. Uh, but we, yeah, we're excited because there's so many places that could be an outpost location and uh, with, with people traveling, um, you know, we're, we're, we're excited to, to, to meet the need. And do you guys do all remodels or do you ever do ground up? We haven't done ground up. We like, we like reno renovations. Um, there is a less of a, a footprint, um, in that yeah. sense, or there can be, um, and there are a lot of there are a lot of assets that out there now that could be repurposed. And and what we find is when we come into a property and and bring our model that we're able to raise the average daily rate, um, offer a product that's um, superior, and then offer services that a typical uh, resort in the places that we operate, especially the smaller ones, um, I, I can't can't match because people are coming to our space. Um, for services that aren't related to to the beds. And that's what's unique about our model into some of these places. Are you guys asset light or do you own any of the properties? We do not own any of the properties. We do not. And we're keen to work with we're keen to work with folks um, who are interested in, in our model um, because we see that that network of getting people from one place to another. Uh, when we opened up Cambodia as a test uh, project in 2018, I remember sitting in Cambodia and, and talking to people and asking them why they're there. And she said, well, I was just in Bali and I had three weeks to spend before I had to go back and you guys were here. So I decided to come here. And so knowing that people were coming to a place because we were there was very um, inspiring to me and, and made me realize that there can be this concept that, that allows people to go to place to place because they feel comfortable um, exploring something new, but having something that doesn't feel completely new and to have friends that they can easily easily meet or, or meet up with. And do you personally have any favorite co-living brands anywhere in the world that you, you like what they're doing? Um, I'm inspired by, uh, there's uh, Bonsko Coworking, which is in, in Bulgaria. And, and what they have done is uh, reform this um, idyllic town in the mountains 
um, and made it a, a um, for lack of a better word, a nomad hub. Um, the community is uh, there is very strong. People are um, spending time there. Some have decided to live there. Um, so I'm really inspired um, with what they are doing uh, in terms of activating a space and putting a, um, a small town on the map. That's a great one. Everybody always like names the big brands. So that's really cool. I know I, the big brands are, are, are great, um, but I don't look at them as, a, um, I mean, I don't look at them as a, a source of competition. Uh, in fact, I look at them as, as an opportunity to, to collaborate. Um, and I, the services they provide are, are, are different. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I like the unique concepts and, and how we can, you know, how we can, how I can learn from them. Cool. So my last question for you, David, is if we fast forward 10 years, where do you see co-living as an industry globally? I believe it's taking over for what's lost in, in terms of the office space. And, and one of the things that I've looked at is how does, um, when we look at workspace, how does workspace change so that the office doesn't cater to the needs of the company, it caters to the needs of the individual. And so what I see is, 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 is co-working changing towards serving the needs of the individual. And I think co-living uh, as, a, as a corollary is coming in and really focusing on the individual experience while they're in the space rather than the, rather than the transaction. Um, so my hope is that uh, an expectation is we'll see more types of co-living communities um, that are sprouting up. Ours focuses on, on people who want to explore. I think there'll be more co-living places that are on people who want to on, on live um, uh, healthy. And I'd like to, I'm inspired by those types of, of communities um, to see a vibrant diversity of communities. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's where I see it going. Awesome. Well, David, I really appreciate you coming on this week. I know it's 7 a.m. here in California, but I know it's, it's pretty thank late you. there over there in Singapore. So thanks again for coming on this week. I appreciate it, Christine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for checking out this week's episode. And keep in mind, we are on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, and iTunes. And also, if you are a co-living community, you can reach out to us to be listed on the Kindred platform. That's K-N-D-R-D dot I-O. It's a great way to showcase pictures, videos, virtual tours of your community. Also, we have a link in the show notes for our three books on co-living. You can also find one of them on amazon.com if you like the print version. And lastly, a very quick shout out to our partners over at ISL Furnishings. They bring light to your vision and already work with some of the larger companies like Star City and Quarters. See you guys next week.